welcome to Austin Tech Connect, the official podcast of the Austin Technology Council, presented to you by NetSpend. Homegrown in Austin, NetSpend has been a leading provider of consumer and business payment solutions for almost 25 years. From prepaid cards to mobile bank accounts to money movement services, NetSpend connects people, brands, and payment products to deliver innovative financial solutions. Welcome to Austin Tech Connect the podcast about the future of Austin's technology community. My name is Tom Singer, and I am the CEO at the Austin Technology Council. And every single week, I have the honor to interview local tech leaders to hear their stories of success and to get their advice on how we can all thrive into the future. And today, I'm excited to welcome an old friend, somebody I have known since the mid-1990s when he was with Austin Ventures, and that is Stephen Strauss. Stephen is the co-founder and managing director at Kung Fu AI. And today we're going to talk a little bit about his career, a little bit about his company, and a lot about AI and what it means to the future for all of us. Hey, Stephen, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you, Tom. So for those of you who don't know Stephen, like I said, he spent nine years with Austin Ventures during the dot-com era, the boom, the bust, the whole thing. But before that, he had already been an entrepreneur, and he's been with several companies since that time. In fact, Kung Fu AI is his fifth startup. So I think we could call him a real, true serial entrepreneur and tech investor. So, Stephen, how did you even get into this crazy world of technology? Let's go back in the time machine to college. What did you major in? What did you think you were going to do? And and where did your career go from there? Uh, Sure. Um... Well, so that's a good question, Tom. You know, my entrepreneurial journey really started in college. I just didn't quite realize it at the time, but <clears throat> I was a political science major at Colgate. Hey, um, I, uh, I was a political science major. Of course, not at, <laughs> not at a school like Colgate. I was, at, I was at a little party school, state school in California. But either way, I was a poli-sci major. Um, and, and I still, I, 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 I'm glad I majored in poli-sci. And, uh, you know, I think I, I deeply believe in the liberal, art, liberal arts background. Um and uh, politics has always fascinated me. I was a, an inveterate um, newspaper reader from a young age. I don't know how I got that, but I still read the newspaper, uh, many newspapers all the time. So, but anyway, um, uh, but I had taught myself to program uh, when I was in middle school and high school. My older brother um, is still a, uh, you know, a, a computer, he was a computer science major. He's four years older than I am. And um, I think at a sibling rivalry, since he was teaching himself to program, I taught myself to program. I programmed games and uh, things in high school. Um, he is still a uh, professional programmer. So uh, I recognized that I was not as good as him and and, uh, and therefore thought maybe I wasn't good. And so I decided not to do that. But I think that actually was well, uh, even, even though it was based on sibling rivalry, I think it suited me well because I uh, my skill set and personality, um, you know, is not, uh, is not, uh, something that I'd be, I would thrive in that area. But when I was in college, um, I had, um, talked to a friend who was a year older than me at different, at a different school. And he told me that he had started a political science journal at his college. And I thought, wow, that's fascinating. Um, I wonder if there's a political science journal at my co- my college, uh, cause I'd like to work on that. And I went back to college sophomore year after the summer, and there wasn't a political science term. And so I started asking around about why not. And someone said, well, you know, you can start a club. And I hadn't thought about that. And so I ended up starting the Colgate Political Review. And um, the first thing I realized was that the way you get something published at the time, and like this is 1984 or something, um, the way you get something published was to use a a uh, chemical-based photo typesetter. So there was a green screen, only like three or four people on campus knew how to use it. They would type up all your content. They would they would basically develop like a film development system, long strips of paper. You would cut them out with X-Acto knives and you would put wax on the back and put it on big pieces of paper. And that's how you laid out your publication. So I know I'm dating myself. I'm, uh, you know, I graduated from college in 87. I'm 58 years old. Um, but Apple had just come out with the uh, the laser printer and Adobe had just come out with PageMaker. And so I went to the, the dean uh, of student affairs and I said, you know, you could replace all that with, um, you know, desktop publishing, which was a brand new term. And so she said, sounds great. Put together a budget. And so I um, 
put together a budget. They approved it. And then I realized as I was unpacking everything that um, I went from the back of the line to the front of the line of getting things published because I was the newest publication. I couldn't get any time with the people who were working in that equipment. But now I had was the only person on campus who knew how to use this equipment. And I spent a bunch of time you know, not just setting it up and learning it, but then teaching the other student groups how to do this. And so I had this epiphany one day when I was uh, driving up to campus in my senior year that I actually probably had a marketable skill, which was that I knew how to do desktop publishing and other people didn't. So I called my parents and asked what they thought about me starting a company after college. Um, And, uh, you know, to my great uh, excitement, they said, you know, what, what, what a better time. You don't have any dependents. You know, I have four kids now. So now I really understand dependents. Uh, I know you do too, Tom. Um, you know, they're, you're like, they don't, you have no expenses, you got no mortgage. Um, and so I started a services firm as an individual, uh, first year started hiring people. My second year invited one of my, uh, best friends from high school who hated his job, um, to join me to help run it, um, and built a services firm, the biggest project that we did, um, and I started that in Washington, D.C., originally from New York, but uh, decided to move to D.C. in part because I like politics, but um, uh, did this company there. The biggest project we did is we um, redid the entire publishing system of National Geographic's Traveler magazine. That was the highest profile project we did. Which, and it was which is hysterical that you're a kid out of college who had some you know, desktop, desktop publishing experience and you're working with National Geographic. It's one of your biggest clients. Yeah, yeah. No, it was it was uh, it was exciting stuff. But uh, it was essentially the exact same project just at a massive scale that I did at Colgate. They had they had photo typesetters and they knew that this was the newest technology and they didn't know what to do. And um, and so uh, that that's kind of how my entrepreneurial journey started. I started a services company with just one person because I thought I had something that uh, that, you know, businesses might be interested in. So then you ended up along the way at Austin Ventures. What brought you to Austin and what got you involved with venture capital? So um, I uh, started, ran, and sold that company over five and a half years, uh, a company that we did a lot of partnering with bought us, and they happened to be uh, backed by a venture capital firm. And so I was super intrigued by uh, being an entrepreneur again, but I also, you know, was frustrated by the fact, one, that I had no idea what I was doing when I started the company, because I literally had never had a full-time job when I started it. As an aside, I remember having to call my dad and I started hiring people. I'm like, do you give the day off? Do you give Thanksgiving off? And do you give the day after Thanksgiving off? Like, I didn't even know that level of basic norms in business because I literally had never had a job. And yet I'm hiring people much older than I am who have been in the workforce for a long time. So, um, so anyway, after I sold my company, I decided that I wanted to learn how to do entrepreneurship in a, you know, in a higher growth way. And I was very intrigued by being backed by, uh, venture capital. And so I decided to apply to business schools and I ended up getting recruited to uh, Austin Ventures at a business school in 96. And during the time that I was at business school, my my thinking flipped from wanting to be a high growth entrepreneur backed by uh, you know venture capital as opposed to a slower growth services firm that I bootstrapped. Um, my my thinking flipped that I wanted to be a venture capitalist. And so I essentially used um, you know, a significant amount of time at business school doing a non-standard search. You know, everyone who comes to recruit at business schools, I, I basically was not interested in. And I was very focused on trying to find a VC role. And um, I got recruited by Austin Ventures out of business school in 96 through a program called the Kaufman Fellows Program, which was in its second year at the time. And that program um, is a is still going on today. It's a great program. And it was the avenue by which Austin Ventures found me and I found them. And I had a two-year fellowship in uh, 96 to 98. Nice. And, and that goes back to about the time that, that I met you. And that was during the, the sort of dot-com era and everything was happening. Everybody you met had a startup. Everybody was looking for venture money and everybody was going to go, you know, from here to the moon. Everybody was going to be, you know, the new, new thing. So what happened during that time that influences you even today? What did you learn being involved with venture capital back in the late 90s? Yeah. So, Tom, um, I started um, Kung Fu AI, which is an AI professional services firm, uh, five and a half years ago. And my observation back then was that we were getting close to entering 
the age of AI. Back in the 90s, we were entering the internet era. And, um, you know, I was uh, I was off by t- on the timing. I thought it would take less than the five and a half years since I started the company to get to where we are today, which is where um, much of the world has realized that we are in this new age. Um, and ChatGPT, which was launched on November 30th, um, really was the the thing that um, made people aware of this. And in the 90s, uh, there became an expression of, uh, you know, the Netscape moment. And so when Netscape went public in 96, that was a big, um, there was a huge amount of awareness about the internet after that, because people were like, what is this company? And why did it go public? And why is it so valuable? And why are people so excited about it? So I look at ChatGPT as our Netscape moment, if you will. Yep. I think the analogy is is relatively I, strong. I totally can but, see and agree with that. But um, you know, um, I, I just uh, since you know uh, I started thinking about Kung Fu in in uh, 2016 and working on it in 2017, I've had this you know just strong belief that um, we were on the you know the precipice of of entering the age of AI, and um, I wanted to start a company that would catch that wave. And my initial thinking was around building a product company because I was at Austin Ventures investing in product companies in the 90s. Um, But for a couple of reasons, Tom, I decided that I was much more interested in starting a services company um, at the dawn of the AI uh, era as opposed to a product company. And and that was based on, you know, a a lot of the pattern matching that I was trying to do uh, relative to what I learned and, and observed back in the 90s. So let's let's talk about that. We you know, let's tran- transform into the the current age here of kung fu AI. You know, you bring up Chat GPT. I think a mistake that a lot of people make is they equate Chat GPT with AI instead of it being a subset of AI. What what I've learned, and and I certainly don't know that much, is that AI is a lot of things. It's not a thing. There's a lot of things going on there. So where does Kung Fu AI fit into this big umbrella of AI? And what do you think about what I said about people just thinking chat GPT is AI? I completely agree with you on that. There's um, there's a whole range of capabilities under the broad heading of AI. Um, the heading AI, you know, and the terms machine learning, deep learning, et cetera, are um, fuzzy enough for non-practitioners that I just suggest to people to stay out of the semantic discussion. Um, if you're not a technologist, if you're not, you know, a practicing professional AI professional, I think it's just easier to say AI. And under that big umbrella, um, chat GPT is one of a whole range of capabilities. It's the, you know, this generative AI using large language models, which is what uh, chat GPT is is just one of, of many and a new one and very powerful, um, but so early in its development that it is, um, you know, it's very unclear as to where it's going to go, but it's clear that it's going to evolve uh, a lot and rapidly. Um, so that's how I would answer that. And then tell me what your other part of that question was. Well, I think I was saying that, you know, it's 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 such a big umbrella of AI. Where does Kung Fu AI fit in? What exactly do you do? Who are your clients and 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 what do you what where do you go from here? That's yeah. So that's a that's a that's a great question. You know, we have built this services firm to meet this moment. And what I mean by that is we've built a set of service offerings to help companies um manage the transition into this age of AI so that they can lead and compete in this new age of AI. And, and do it ethically and responsibly. And so that's really our positioning. Uh, we help companies um, transform into an AI-centric uh, company to be able to lead and compete in this new age ethically and responsibly. So I love this idea of, of helping people transition into this age of AI, but but I think for a lot of us, what is what is the age of AI and, and why does my company need to care necessarily? What, what, what does this mean on a practical day-to-day basis? So, Tom, the the basis of competition is changing in that prior to this moment now, um, we have been competing with a set of technologies at its core that include the Internet, mobile, et cetera. And there have been companies for the last decade or more that have been heavily leveraging AI 
we know their names. They include, you know, um, Facebook, you know, Microsoft, Apple, Netflix, and, you know, some others. Um, but most companies have not been using this technology, or if they have, it's been, you know, they've been dipping their toes in the water. But the kinds of capabilities that those leaders have, every company will have over the next couple decades. Just like in the 90s, the, you know, the early adopters and the dot-com, you know, internet native companies uh, got out ahead and, you know, eventually every company has be- on the planet has become an internet company. We don't just don't call it that anymore. But back in the 90s, the basis of competition and communication were phones, faxes, and FedEx. And, you know, in the 90s, if you thought that that was going to continue, then you ended up being left behind and you were disrupted by companies that evolved into internet-centric companies or what we called at the time dot-com companies, which we would call today internet native companies. And today, if you are not thinking about building out your plans for how you're going to evolve into using um, AI-centric technologies to compete, you're doing the same thing. It's kind of like being an ostrich with your hand your head in the sand. Um, you will be disrupted by your current competitors who do make this evolution or, um, you know, AI first native uh, companies that are springing up uh, left and right. So as we look to the the types of companies that you look to work with uh, at Kung Fu AI and the services that you bring, what 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 is the products that you're offering? What types of companies, how large of companies are you working with and, and what are you doing to transform them? Sure. So um, to date, we have been worked with companies um, from well-funded startups up to what I call the upper middle market, which uh, we define as $10 billion or less. Um, I would say most of our clients are in the, you know, uh, 100 million to 10 billion range. Um, we have had enterprise companies uh, that we've worked with and we plan on doing more of that. But to start with, we decided to not, you know, try to compete against uh well, even go after the biggest companies. So we've got inbound uh, interest from those and have worked with some. And, um, you know, uh, the service offerings that we have, Tom, is um, we start with strategy. And we, uh, our strategy team is led by uh, Dr. Ben Herndon, who used to be the head of AI strategy at Vista Equity Partners. And strategy for us starts with um you know, helping companies figure out their first applications of AI. What are the first use cases where there's real ROI, there's data available, and, um, you know, the technical complexity is um, low so that you can get a quick win and the company can, um, you know, realize that this is something that is achievable for them. The second part of strategy is to build out a, you know, three to five year roadmap that's aligned with their business roadmap about how they become uh, how they embrace AI across the enterprise um, and they, they evolve into being an AI centric company. The bulk of our team, Tom, are machine learning engineers um, and many of them are out of the tech giants. So um, Google, Apple, Twitter, et cetera. And we build custom machine learning capabilities for our clients. We, um, we uh, build them, we put them into production in their environments. We uh, help scale them and we help maintain them. And the third service offering after strategy and engineering is what we call operations and transformation. And we will help operate those you know, capabilities that we put into production. And we also help them bring these capabilities in-house. We will do or teach everything that we do. So You know, if you're a CEO and you need to develop a strategy, we will both um, do a strategy for you or help you uh, understand how you build an AI strategy if you want to do do it internally. Same thing for the CTO. Um, Same thing for, you know, the uh, kind of all the different aspects of of what we do for all the different parts of the enterprise that 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 we touch. And we touch, um, you know, we often start in one place, but but uh, over time we touch all aspects of the enterprise. So is Austin sort of an AI hub? Are there a lot of companies who have their toe in? I, I can think of three or four that I that I personally know 
But, you know, as, as we start peeling back, you know, we, we see this in the, in the world of tech that certain things like biotech happens in certain cities and, and fintech, we have a big fintech crowd here in Austin and, and, you know, different things like that is, is Austin one of the AI hubs where, where is this stuff being done the most? Well, Tom, you know, it's, it's following the typical pattern for Austin, which is, you know, the epicenter of AI is in Silicon Valley, but Austin is absolutely a contender and, uh, you know, is uh, punching above its weight as far as, you know, size, et cetera. Um, we, we were a hundred percent, uh, building our team in Austin pre-pandemic and we had physical space and we were in person and with the pandemic, we sublet our space. We are now, um, uh, you know, uh, remote first. And we've been hiring around North America since then and, and plan to continue doing that. But there is, um, there's plenty of talent in Austin and, um, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of people who are upskilling into this capability, um, you know, daily, you know, this is, this is, this is the trend. So technical people and business people are, you know, are learning this stuff on the fly and, and Austin will continue to evolve and be a, um, I think a great hub for AI. So this is a great transition. I like to bring everybody on the show and ask them, especially people like you who've been around Austin for, you know, 27 plus years, you know, wh- where do you think Austin is just in general right now as a tech community? What do you think our strengths are? Maybe some of our weaknesses and where do you think we're going? What does the future of Austin tech look like? Are, are, are we still bullish on Austin? Oh, I'm, I'm bullish on Austin in, in almost all regards. And uh, I'm not going to say anything new by saying that the the things that I'm not bullish on are things like uh, transportation and affordability. Um, and, uh, but, and I think we have to do better than that. And I think we can, you know, we're a smart, creative, you know, uh, and we, we need to do better in, in those regards. And I think uh, we should be aspire to be leaders and not laggards in those things that we are not strong in, but um, no, I'm very bullish on Austin. You know um, I think that uh, Austin is well past the critical mass and all the basic elements, uh, not just basic, but all the elements for uh, a vibrant tech ecosystem. Uh, back in the nineties, you know, it was, th- there were all the elements there, but they weren't, um, there wasn't nearly as much strength and, and um, uh, you know, across the category. So there were absolutely capital sources, lawyers who understood, you know, tech deals Um you know, accounting firms that did, you know, bankers that did, et cetera. But the depth across all those categories and all the ancillary categories is just so much uh, deeper and more vibrant. And and um, I don't really spend a lot of time paying attention to the tech entrepreneurial ecosystem like I did uh, long ago, but um, it really seemed to accelerate during the pandemic and, uh, you know, with, with people relocating here. And uh, so, I think that the future is very bright uh, as it relates to tech ecosystem. So what do you think are some of the problems that we have? Um, as a tech besides, ecosystem? Besides or, traffic. I mean, as a tech ecosystem. Um, what are the problems we have? Um, that's a good question. I, I don't know that I have anything specific that I would say uh, right now. I'll tell you one of the big strengths that I think Austin has that I, that I don't hear a lot of people talking about is um, the culture of Austin, you know, uh, I guess people talk about it, but I don't think it's as widely recognized around the country. You know, when I've done entrepreneurial activities on the East coast and the West coast, which are very different from each other. Um, I feel like, uh, Austin compares significantly favorably to both those, uh, uh, cultures that I've experienced in the New York uh, Boston area and the San Francisco Bay area, which is where I've primarily done entrepreneurial activities. I think Austin's tech culture is vastly superior to the East coast and superior to the the West coast. People are more collaborative. They are more open to helping without any expectation of being, uh, of anything coming back to them. Uh, in particular are two of the, uh, the areas that I think we thrive in and, um, Again, I think that uh, compares very favorably to the East Coast, where my experience is people won't even think about helping you until they figure out what's in it for them. <laughs> um, and in Silicon Valley, there's, um, you know, there's a, it's more cut, tech, tech entrepreneurship is more cutthroat. People are more willing to, uh, you know, 
steal from each other, whether it's ideas or people, et cetera. And so there's a, there's a, there's, there's less gardenness here, guardedness here, nice. um, which I think is great. And I really hope that we keep that and that we don't import some of those negative aspects from these other tech sectors. Well, they're all moving here. So we've got to, we've got to educate them all on what the culture is and why it is so important. And in fact, one of the things that, you know, I talk about constantly with everybody I talk about is, you know, we have to make sure that we don't kill the golden goose, that we have to continue as more and more people come here. We have to continue to keep that Austin vibe. I don't know that we're that weird anymore, but there definitely is that cultural piece where, you know, you can pick up the phone and and some of these entrepreneurs you'd never be able to reach in other cities. You're only one degree of separation away, you know, here, here and here in Austin. So, well, Tom, you, you, you mentioned d- degree. I, I would say uh, one of the other uh, challenges that Austin increasingly has is the weather. You know, <laughs> this summer is just brutal. Uh, you know, this whole week when I looked at the the weather, it was all under all over 100 degrees. So, um, yeah, I got away for vacation and went to Scotland, and it was 70 degrees every day. And I, I, I came back and thought, oh, I forgot what summer is supposed to be like after being gone just eight days. Yeah, that sounds fantastic. So. Everybody who comes on the show, I like to ask them this question, and that is that I personally believe that community, collaboration, and conversations are the conduit to save all problems. And You and I both have a background in political science. I always say, what if all of our elected officials in Washington, D.C., every day, regardless of which party they were from, when they walked into the Capitol building, they had to lead with community, collaboration, and conversation? Would we get more things done and have less infighting? I think the answer would be yes. And so everyone who comes on the show, I like to ask them, which of those words resonates with you the most and why? Well, Tom, um, you asked me about this before, so I I did a little reflecting on it. And, you know, I think um, they're all, I agree with you, they're all critically important, but I think the foundation of those three is conversation. Um, I think that, um, you know, uh, we could we could solve our problems. We could be leaders um, with conversation, which requires listening. Um, And um, I think, you know, if you are vulnerable and, you know, um, listen and think and, you know, converse, you are on the path to collaboration and, you know, building and strengthening community. So yep. um, I think those are the key elements. And I think, I think vulnerability is the, you know, is a, is a key aspect to uh, great conversations and the foundation for vulnerability is trust. And so I think trust gets built, um, you know, through personal connections and conversation. So that's where I would, that's where I would go. No, I, I, I love that. And it really holds true to, to, to what I believe. One of the things that we're trying to do with the Austin Technology Council is have more conversations between all of these groups who make up, you know, all parts of our ecosystem, from the entrepreneurs to those who do the funding to the individuals who work inside of companies and all of the different organizations, both nonprofit and for-profit, who are serving this greater ecosystem. I think we have to have more conversations. We have to work together more and we have to remember to put that community first. So, so we're leading with that. And in fact, this year's CEO slash C-suite summit, it's been called the CEO summit forever, but it's always been open to everybody in the C-suite. And last year I had about seven CTOs tell me I would have come if I had known I could have come. I heard my friend went. And so I, I changed the name to the CEO slash C-suite summit. Uh, this year we are going to have something we added last year, which is roundtable conversations about the topics that are really driving conversation and and thought here in Austin and try and get some feedback from the people at the tables who are in that room. Because again, those conversations, you never know where it's going to lead to the spark for the next idea that can help ATC and others uh, help this community thrive. So uh, uh, I'm doing a little commercial for my own event, November 6th, uh, the CEO C-Suite Summit. Mark your calendars now. We'd like to have everybody at this year's event. So Stephen, before I let you go, one more question. I've lived in Austin for 32 plus years. In fact, my my anniversary is this month now for 32 years in Austin. And so many things have changed. So many places we used to go to when I first got here are gone. Uh, the pandemic wasn't kind to a lot of restaurants and, I know. and, and other places uh, that, you know, we we patronized for years. Plus, there's all of the, the, the attractions, the, the Capitol building, the uh, Barton Springs, et cetera. If somebody came from out of town, one of your high school buddies came to visit. 
and they were just going to be here for a couple of days and you and your wife were going to take them to one place that still exists, where would you take them? Um, yeah, Tom, I, I drive around Austin and think about all the things that have, we've lost. Uh, just the other day, I was driving right by Dart Bowl and I just oh. got sacked because so much fun to dart the bowl there. And, and who would have thought they'd have good food? Well, the, I was going to say the enchiladas were out of, out of this world. Um, but, um, you know, uh, Tom, that's easy for me because uh, here, here's this little background. I ruptured a disc in 2016 and I realized that if I swam laps, my back feels great. And when I don't, then it starts to, you know, worry me that it's going to go out. And so I have uh, been swimming three to four days a week uh, since then at Deep Eddy. Oh, and nice. I love Deep Eddy for laps. And I love Barton Springs for just hanging out in the water. And uh, so I would answer that with, I think, a very common answer for people in Austin, which is those two pools. But um, uh, I think they're terrific. And one of the things I've just uh, rediscovered um, just in the last couple of weeks, because it's been so hot, I've been to Barton Springs after hours a couple of times recently, and I had forgotten how much fun that is. And uh, they're now open till they're open to 10 p.m. at this time of year. Yep. And um you know, I've been showing up a couple of times at 8.30 or 9, and it's just super fun. And the other day I did something I'd never seen, or I saw something I'd never seen before. I ended up there on a full moon night. And I don't know if you know this, Tom, but uh, but um, people go uh, to, it's like a thing to go to Barton Springs on a full moon night. So it was like packed like it was during the day. <laughs> and every, you know, five or 10 minutes from one end of the pool to the other, people would start a howl at the moon. And then all of a sudden it would just go, you know, across the entire pool till everyone was doing a howling at the moon and then it would settle down and everyone would go back to talking. And then five or 10 minutes later it would happen again. It was funny. I, I, I didn't know this, but now I'm going to check my calendar for the next full moon and, and maybe do a, a, an eight thirty or nine o'clock swim and, and, and maybe howl at the moon. Well, give me a call. I'll meet you there. And um, and 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 what I liked about it is it it felt like the old keep Austin weird. So yeah, um, yeah. There's not. I don't think there's as much weirdness as there used to be 32 years ago. So I like it. I love the weirdness when I can find it. So hey, Stephen, thank you so much for being here. Good luck with everything you're doing at Kung Fu AI, and we hope to see you around uh, the Austin Tech uh, community at different events and things that are going on for the rest of the year. We'll see you soon. Well, Tom, I just want to say uh, thank you for hosting me here. And also, thank you for all your leadership um, at the ATC. I really uh, appreciate it and deeply respect what you are trying to do here. So um, uh, thank you and best of luck. And I appreciate being on your podcast. Well, thank you. I, I was brought into ATC to reinvent the group and uh, we're trying. But as I tell everybody, if we're going to go back to being a grassroots organization, we need the support of the grassroots. We can't do it without the leaders in this community helping us guide where this organization goes. So we invite everybody to come back and join the Austin Technology Council. So thank you to everybody who tuned in and listened to this episode. Make sure that every week you're tuning in because every week we're finding somebody just as interesting as Steven who's sharing their thoughts and ideas about their companies, about entrepreneurship, and about the future of Austin. And make sure that you check out our calendar at austintechnologycouncil.org because we've got events every month and November 6th, we've got the big CEO slash C-Suite Summit. We'll see you all there. Thanks for listening to the Austin Tech Connect podcast. Make sure your company is a member of the Austin Technology Council and add your voice to the future of our tech ecosystem in Central Texas.